some of these weird nice diagnosis presentations, but they're tested quite frequently. So um, we'll talk about nice diagnosis, the different types of nice diagnosis, and really try and hit on some testable things. So you probably already know that nice diagnosis just as kind of an involuntary movement of the eyes. There's different types, and we characterize it by how the eyes move. Do they move back and forth in a horizontal plane? Are they more circular um, or pendular? Um, one of the, the real testable um, concepts is Alexander's Law, so they will ask you this at some point on some sort of test. But the speed of the nystagmus is greater when you look towards the fast phase. Um, I don't know a great way to, to memorize that, except that it's the opposite of the null point, which is kind of how I remember it. So the null point we use clinically because um, the vision is better for these. Even though someone who's had nystagmus from childhood or birth they usually don't have oscillopsia or the sensation that your world is moving even though your eyes are, but um, they still do have more subtle symptoms in that their vision is better when their eyes are more still. And for many people, they do have a null point. Not everybody with nystagmus has a null point, but many people do. And their null point is the direction of gaze where the movement of their eyes is the least. So that's the opposite of Alexander. So Alexander's would be the opposite of where their null point is. That's kind of one way to, to think about it. So we talk about nystagmus as how fast it is, how large are the movements, and what direction are the movements, horizontal, vertical, rotary, oblique. <clears throat> and um, when we're evaluating an infant with nystagmus, these are the new terms that sometimes I'll I'll revert back to the old terms because these don't totally, they're not totally intuitive to me, but um, you can have kind of an idiopathic nystagmus, which used to be called uh, congenital kind of motor, um, and now they kind of call the infantile nystagmus syndrome, they call that, they lump all of these into it. Um, so within that is the idiopathic where they're going to have normal vision, normal vision development, normal dilated eye exam, normal refraction. They just have movement, eye movements. Uh, but then there can be kids with albinism. That's a big reason we see um, nystagmus in, you know, three, four-month-olds. Um, less commonly, we'll see it early on with retinal diseases. Sometimes we can see it later. You certainly can see it early with like Liebers and things. We just don't see that a lot. Um, and then there's this fusion maldevelopment syndrome, which used to be called latent nystagmus. <laughs> we'll go over that um, in a little bit. But uh, essentially, the things you want to look for in a kid who has nystagmus. Well, you want to know, like, are they tracking at all? Because usually these kids are pretty young, so you're not going to get a visual, an actual visual acuity. But can they see? Because if they can see, it's probably not some terrible degeneration of their retina. Um, and then some of these retinal conditions, like Liebers and um, congenital stationary night blindness and some of these other retinal degenerative conditions have this thing called a paradoxical constriction of the pupil when you um, turn on the lights. So if the lights are dim, um, uh, sorry, when you turn off the lights. So if you dim the lights, you would expect a normal pupil to dilate, in, um, but they do the opposite thing. So it, that's not 100% sensitive for those conditions, but it makes you think there's something going on with the retina if you see that. Um, do they have um, uh, transillumination defects in their iris? Uh, that can be indicative of albinism. Do they have foveal hypoplasia? What's their light reflex like? Is there something that's just blocking their vision and that's why they, they can't see and they've developed nystagmus? So you really have to kind of, these are the things to focus on. Um, and, and it all speaks to the differential that we've kind of talked about. Albinism is the thing, albinism we see a lot in, in eyes that look pretty normal. Um, uh, 
except for that absence of the foveal light reflex. Um, but, but another big one we see is optic nerve hypoplasia. Those are probably the biggest, most common reasons, but certainly these other ones can, um, can be seen. And then um, we have kind of, they've lumped this in now um, uh, to the same category, but really clinically you, you really want to differentiate a sensory nystagmus where they can't see to a nystagmus where they can see but their eyes shake. And so, um, so you just have to kind of pay attention to that. They most often will be pendular if they're, or kind of rotary without a pattern if they just can't see. And then um, the, the, the type of nystagmus that previously was called congenital motor nystagmus where they're vision is normal, it's not associated with anything, any other um, health conditions or ocular abnormalities, but the things that I want to test you on is that it's, um, it remains horizontal in all directions of gaze. And um, this is how they characterize it now, I think this is from I can't keep up with when they update your BCSC, but this was a recent BCSC um, book. So they congenital motor is now infantile nystagmus syndrome, and um, but essentially this this um, talks about kind of the same the same features. So this is a nice way to to highlight some of these features. I like to use this more than that other chart. The information's the same, but um, but convergence. So this is something I actually test in clinic. I look to make sure it's horizontal in all directions of gaze, and then I see if it dampens with convergence. That first one, and you're not really going to know if they have oscillopsia because usually you're seeing these kids so young. Um, the null zone usually doesn't d develop until kind of you know early childhood most often, and it can change once it does develop. So you want to look for that, and, but it, um, it's not going to be there in a young kid. And then um, near visual acuity is usually better because their eyes shake less when they converge, so you're, you'll see that later on in these kids. Um, and then one thing they love to test on is inversion of the optokinetic response, so we have that here. Um, so if you look at the bottom, so a normal OKN drum, if you rotate it to the left, you're going to get left pursuit and right jerk. That's just normal. And then for somebody with this type of nystagmus, let's say they have right jerk nystagmus, so they're fast, you always name it by the fast phase, which means their fast phase is to the right, a horizontal jerk nystagmus. So they would either have less a less jerky right phase or they would actually switch to the left if they had this type of nystagmus. We don't, we can usually figure it out pretty well in clinic, but, um, but, so we don't often use this, but they love to test it. The other things they love to test, um, so the slow phase, does anyone know this? The, what happens with this slow phase um, velocity for these kids? They love to test that. Good job, guys. And then um, we already talked about dampened by convergence. So they like to call this one fusional maldevelopment syndrome, but in clinic you'll hear us refer to this as latent nystagmus. And um, they call it fusional maldevelopment because now they think the source is related to just a poor development of binocularity. But essentially what you're going to see is you look at the kid, they do not have nystagmus. You occlude one eye and they start to have nystagmus. And um, it's usually a horizontal jerk, nystagmus. It's also dampened by fusion and it's disrupted by, uh, increased by disruption of fusion, which is why it comes out when you cover one eye. Um, and it classically occurs in a triad with congenital esotropia and DVD. So um, this, I think, 
um, this is more helpful. So the, the things they like to test you on. So when one eye is covered, the jerk nystagmus is present um, in, what did I write? In present, well, it techni technically is present, but you're not looking at the eye that's covered. So what the, the point of this is the fast phase is is it towards the covered or uncovered eye? They love to test this. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and then the, we just talked about this. There's a classic triad. If you, It's not always the case. You can see latent nystagmus in other settings, but um, you commonly see this in kids with what two other conditions? Yeah, and then um, importantly, binocular visual acuity is better in these kids, and we also find that it is better to test their vision with a frosted occluder. That's true for most forms of nystagmus, rather than a than a completely um, opaque occluder. So, um, and it's based on this principle, and and really the reason is because. The shaking eye movements, again, often do not give them oscillopsia, but they do degrade their visual quality. And then um, you see it, with this one, you see an exponential decrease in the velocity of the slow phase. So that's distinguishing it from the infantile nystagmus syndrome. This is a big one. I do see it from time to time, and it's very testable. So this is acquired. It's usually um, acquired within the first year few years of life, and classically this is going to have a shimmering characteristic to the nystagmus, and it literally, if you haven't seen it before, it literally looks like shimmering. It doesn't look like any nystagmus you've seen, it's usually really rapid shimmering, and um, it's, I've, it's very, very often asymmetric. I don't think I've seen one that even looks symmetric. I mean, the degree of how asymmetric can vary but, some, but it is always asymmetric, and it can be in any direction, um, and sometimes intermittent. So, and the reason we worry about this spasmus nutans is because um, it can be associated with other conditions that are bad. So, um, to diagnose it, it's in a triad of head, sorry, I added this stuff in to try and do a flipped classroom, but, but then I forget, and I just, Look it. So um, it's a triad of head bobbing and torticollis with a nystagmus. And um, you, you do see the head bobbing. The torticollis, I mean, their head position is always, it's just they're putting their head in a weird position and they're kind of like moving their head around and you see the shimmering nystagmus. And so you do clinically see this, this triad. Um, it, if it's truly a spasmus nutans, it disappears by five years of age and it's benign. But um, it can be associated with chiasmal or suprachiasmal tumors. And so you always have to scan these kids. Um, and then if their scan is normal, you just kind of wait it out. So periodic alternating nystagmus is one we don't see a lot, but I have seen it, you know, a handful of times. Uh, it's usually really really hard for patients um, because it's a jerk nystagmus that switches directions and you can see this in clinic. Um, their fast phase will be to the right and then it'll kind of slow down and then it'll ramp up on the left and their fast phase will go to the left. So they can't, you know, there's like no head position that really gives them a null point and it's just um, very debilitating. Uh, visually and uh, they can try and alternate their head posture to continually kind of chase that null but it's really hard to do so. Um, it, the, the biggest thing about this um, is that they want to know that you know it can be associated with albinism, Chiari, MS, and stroke. So for most of these other ones the 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 
dangerous associations and the fact you should scan them are kind of the key things they're going to test you on most often. I do have, this is a, one of my patients, but I don't know why it's not, oh here. Just follow the cameras and keep it. So she was actually going to have a procedure. She was in the OR, so you can um, we can talk about what she's going to have in a minute. But um, monocular nystagmus is never good. Um, you, it can be spasmus nutans. That's really asymmetric, and I have seen that. But you always have to scan monocular nystagmus. Um, it's not always associated with. Uh, you know, a brain abnormality, a glioma or something, but but it's very possible. And then there is this hyman belshowski phenomenon. I don't think they test that very often, but it's good to kind of have it in your mind. That is just basically a monocular nystagmus that's due to really bad vision in one eye for any number of reasons. And it's usually related to the amblyopia. We do see that, but if you just see a patient with monocular nystagmus, you, that's not your first thought, even though that's probably the most common thing. You, your first thought is you have to rule out a tumor. And then the same is true for seesaw, which I'm sure you guys know. This one I've seen really rarely, but when you see it, it's completely obvious because they have kind of the seesaw pattern of their eyes. And usually when I see it, it's um, taking care of neurosurgery patients. Um, and it's associated because it's associated with brain lesions in the rostral midbrain or the supracellar area. And the thing they always will test you on is that it's a craniopharyngioma in kids and they get bitemporal defects. So that is very, very commonly tested, that association with a craniopharyngioma. So convergence retraction nystagmus, you guys probably get this in neuroop because it's also seen commonly in adults. Um, so you kind of know what the features are to look for, but um, in kids, you really want to focus on um, the possibility of aqueductal stenosis or pinealoma. They really test that a lot. And then you probably already know from neuroop that it's really uh, best elicited when the patient tracks a downward rotating, rotating OK endrum. That's the best way to get kind of that um, paralysis of up gaze and the convergence retraction nystagmus that you see with, and it's usually really obvious. Have you guys seen that before? Okay, so obsoloclonus. Um, this one I just saw in clinic, actually. Um, you don't see it very often, but when you do in a kid, it's pretty, I've never seen it not be neuroblastoma. Technically, it can be post-infectious cerebellar ataxia, viral etiologies, um, but I've never seen a kid with this that didn't have neuroblastoma. And um, this, the problem with this is that um, they do have oscillopsia because they didn't have nystagmus before and they had normal, presumably normal vision development, and now their eyes are like moving all over the place in a disorderly fashion. So it's very debilitating. Um, and it is, uh, it's a perineoplastic syndrome, but it's immune mediated, so it's kind of an autoimmune reaction to the tumor. But the problem is it doesn't always go away with treatment of the tumor. Sometimes they require lifelong immune suppression. And it's, it's a syndrome, we think of it most relating to the eyes, but they actually have um, a lot of spastic movements and ataxic movements. So it's kind of a full body um, ataxia, essentially, that um, if they're not on immunosuppression, it will return. So it's really difficult to treat these. I've worked with neurologists who've used like baclofen or anti-seizure medications and things like that. It seems like the immunosuppression is most effective, but it's, it 
Sometimes it goes away with the treatment of the tumor, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then downbeat nystagmus can be heritable, but it's most often thought to be bad, preceding spinocerebellar degeneration. So they do, I remember studying for the boards, I, and it may have just been that year, but I, I was surprised on how much they hit on like what medications could cause things. I don't know if they're still, still doing that because they go in phases, but, um, but this is one that's classically associated with medications that people are commonly on. So I think it's thinking of degeneration or medication when you see downbeat nystagmus is kind of the best approach. Upbeat um, is most often associated with something like MS. Um, and the Bruns nystagmus is something we see more in adults than the pediatric population, mostly because of the association with CP angle tumors like schwannomas. Um, but they get this slow, large amplitude nystagmus and towards the lesion. And when they look away from the lesion, their nystagmus totally changes to this rapid, small amplitude nystagmus. I actually have never seen this. Have you guys seen it? Yeah. So they tested it a lot back in the day, but I never actually saw it. So what do we do with um, nystagmus? So in infancy, if the onset is, um, you know, really young, which is when we're doing most of these nystagmus evaluations, we look for, you know, signs of any um, other causes, uh, like ophthalmologic causes, and that's, I don't know how, oh yeah, it's better up there. So anything that's disrupting their vision, their visual development, things like that, um, can lead to ophthalmologic causes. But if it's developing after infancy and or there are uh, signs of neurologic problems, then um, this is kind of your thought process. And uh, this, I thought this was a fairly useful table. Um, to think about when to do a neurologic workup, but I don't know that they're all, like I don't know, abnormal pregnancy, labor, delivery, that is so common. So I would just say normal eye exam, other motor delays, think about kind of a global syndrome. Um, and then this you guys get this already. I think you get this very thoroughly in um, NeuroOp, but it's, it is important to kind of, more important in the adult population to distinguish these two things. But in kids, the, the place where I see it commonly is um, where they have traumatic injuries and then it involves um, their inner ear and things like that. Then they'll have new onset nystagmus that is more peripheral. And then it helps you know, you know, how to treat it, that it'll go away. Okay, so we, this we've kind of gone over when we talked about. So, so really quickly before we move to our next lecture, we'll talk about how we treat these patients. And not everybody has a null point, but if they do have a null point, it does give us a little bit of ability to um, surgically address their nystagmus. So you can see in the chart, Technically, there are medications they try and use. Um, usually, many of these medications are used by neurologists. Um, we don't do a lot of it, but I, I've never seen any of them work wonderfully. But if you have nystagmus, I mean, you want to try anything, because some of these are certainly um, later onset, so they're, they're having oscillopsia. And, Etc. So I don't know that there's a great medication, but if they do have a null point, um, you can shift their central vision to the null point. We'll talk about that. And you can also, because um, like congenital motor improves with convergence, you can induce convergence with base out prisms. And I've done that from time to time, and it's, and it's worked in certain, certain patients. Um, the surgical treatment of nystagmus is called the Keston-Baum-Anderson uh, 
because of the two people that kind of collectively thought to do this. But in reality, what we more often do is we use the Marshall Parks, and he's the kind of the grandfather of pediatric ophthalmology is what he's called. But, um, but he um, kind of innovated mostly the dose, but essentially you're doing a recess resect procedure on each of the horizontal rectus muscles simultaneously. And you're doing that um, to move the eyes in the direction of the head turn, but you only can do this when there's a null because you're trying to place their null centrally. Um, so they're still gonna look towards their null, but now that's gonna make them look in the center. Um, and so this is just the dosage and things like that. So if there's no null point, uh, there are less options, but there is a disinsertion, reattachment surgery, or a Sinsky procedure, both of which I've done because um, these were advocated also by Marshall Parks and the person I trained with, trained with Marshall Parks. And uh, some kids, so the disinsertion reattachment, you literally take the muscles off and you put them back on. And there's this guy in Pittsburgh who um, does all this nystagmus research with electrodes and things. And his data show that 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 just resets kind of the neurologic inputs to the muscles and can dampen the nystagmus. And what's interesting is for some kids, I have seen dramatic results from that. Like one pediatrician was calling me and like, how did you get this nystagmus to go away? And I was like, well, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And we just have no idea. And then other kids, it's like, well, it looks like I did nothing, so great, you know? And so we have no idea why it can work so miraculously for some kids and other kids not at all. So the Sinsky procedure, um, <coughs> that one you actually, um, you don't just disinsert the muscles, so that's like the next step if, if you don't see an effect with a just disinsertion, reattachment, and they wanna try something else. The Sinsky procedure, you literally take the muscles off the eye wall and let them fly. You do not reattach them. All four rectus, horizontal rectus muscles. And um, I don't do that a lot because the, <laughs> Well, some people do. I know you're laughing because it sounds extreme, but the person I trained with is one of the most famous people in the field, and he does <clears> this <throat> routinely. So, and he actually helps people quite a bit. The, the problem, so it does work, but it, it doesn't always make the nystagmus completely go away, but it does make it better for the vast majority of patients. But the problem is that the lateral will will have more action when it when it reattaches to the globe than the medial just because of the arc of contact of those two muscles naturally on the globe so you tend to to get um, uh, an XT after this and so what he does now he's modified it so he actually sews the lateral rectus to the orbital rim to, to completely like get rid of all of its function and just lets the medials fly and he has less exotropia with that and then they have less nice eyes. They cannot move their eyes a lot, but um, <laughs> they can move them somewhat. <laughs> um, and their nystagmus is better. So, uh, yeah, it's not something I do a lot, but there's a lot of very, very highly respected people who are innovating this procedure. And I think there's a certain patient population that are just so debilitated by their nystagmus that this is attractive to them. So, so keep that in mind. Maybe, maybe someday we'll innovate it further and be able to do even more. All right, so let's, the other topic we were supposed to cover today is this um, vision and amblyopia testing in infants and children. <coughs> and so um, I think you guys 
have some familiar, familiarity with this, but not all of you have done the P's rotation. So let's just talk about what we expect. At birth, we want them to react to light, just blink. And that's usually pre present by about 30 weeks of age. And then at six weeks, we want them to look at faces. That's most often what they're going to do, faces. Three months, we want them to fix and follow on like a lighted toy. And then um, by about two to three years, we'd really like to see if we can get them matching some of the uh, palindromic eye chart images. For those of you familiar with how we test kids, the HOTV and the LEA symbols are palindromes. They're mirror image of each other um, left to right and that there's a developmental phase around this age that where there's left right confusion just normally and so it kind of gets rid of that component of visual testing and then by about five years we want them to read a full smell and line um, the first two are kind of self-explanatory but what do we how do we characterize the fix and follow I do know that the standard practice here is to write fix and the text write fix and follow however um, you'll see us doing a lot of other things to kind of characterize vision and I think that some of those things in a preverbal child tell us more about visual development and so the indirect assessments are um, listed first and then you can do optokinetic nystagmus with the OKN drum you can do teller cards and you can do testing to really understand how the nerve is working in the brain but we'll go over all of the pros and cons so fix and follow you just want to this this is my mentor this is the one who did this who does the Sinsky and wrote this book but um, but you guys all know what this is but don't forget to test each eye individually but then I think this is much more meaningful central study maintained and really in the field this is this is more correct, a more correct way to do it. Um, and so central is um, under monocular conditions. So if, can their eye just look straight at you if it's the only eye looking, which is most often true. If they have nystagmus, they're not gonna have steadiness of fixation. That's also under monocular conditions, but something like nystagmus, you would put unsteady. And then M is really the important one because this means can they maintain fixation and alignment under binocular. So if they're tropic, meaning when they look at you with both eyes, one of their eyes isn't straight, just spontaneously. You don't have to do anything. It's just not straight. Um, so if they're tropic, the M is not, they're not, they don't have the M. They're um, unmaintained is how we put it. Um, but they could still be central because most of those kids who are tropic, they have vision and if you occlude their fixing eye, they will straighten their tropic eye and look at you. So they could be central under monocular conditions but not under binocular, which is the M. This is, this is a, in the field considered the better way to characterize vision. And then it's all based on this fact that we need equal visual input to the two eyes to have equal visual development and not develop amblyopia. So, um, enough, so building on that, the CSM kind of touches on are there risk factors for, for their vision not developing equally? But then how can we actually tell if they have early amblyopia and their, their vision is not developing equally? Well, if they're tropic, then, and they always fix with the same eye, so they're not alternating. It's not like sometimes their right eye straight, sometimes their left eye straight. It's pretty equally one or the other. But it's always their left eye's out, their right eye's straight. It never changes. You don't need to... To do a test, you, you can't really do, in a preverbal child, you can't really do fixation preference testing because they're already showing you what their fixation preference is. Their left eye is not fixing, their right eye is fixing. But if, they're, if they have straight eyes and they have anisometropia, like one eye has a different prescription than the other, you don't know from looking at them that one eye might have amblyopia 
their eyes are straight, they're going to track together. So how can you tell that in a preverbal child, which is really important because it would inform whether you give them glasses or start patching. Um, and so you can do it for the with the cover preference testing like this picture shows, like if they're really upset when you cover one eye but they're totally fine when you cover the other eye then you might think that in this child it would be their left eye would be the fixing eye because if, if their preferred eye is covered, they're upset. If their bad eye is covered, they don't care is the idea. But in reality, kids just don't like you messing with them. So this is not a very sensitive test. A better test that those of you who've worked with me in clinic have seen uh, me do is this induced tropia test. So again, if they're already tropic, you can't really use this, but it, you already know what their fixation preference is. But if their eyes are straight, you can use the induced tropia test, and it's a really effective way to tell you if they have a, a, an eye preference or amblyopia potentially in one of their eyes. So the principle is that, I don't know how this works, you give them double vision by, this is a base down prism. Usually I use a 20, but in anything from about 10 to 20 is okay. Um, you want the images, you're, you're basically giving them two images. And you want them to be able to see both of the images. So if you give them like a 40, the images are gonna be so separated. They're not gonna be able to appreciate there's two images. So that's why the a magnitude of the prism matters. And you have to have them fixing. You can do this at distance or near, but usually I, I have them more reliably fixing it near. And so you want a toy that they really are interested in, and you want them to be visually engaged with that toy. And then what you'll see, so you can see here in this kid that the eyes kind of look like they're looking up at the toy. And that's because he's seeing two images with this right eye. And a, a, ver a higher and a lower image because the prism's there. And he's fixing on the higher image, which can only be seen with this right eye because that's the eye with the prism. So he's using the right eye. And in this image, he's looking straight. He's not looking up. And that means he's not looking at the higher image. He's just looking straight ahead. And so that means he's still just looking at what the image that his right eye is seeing. And so this, this is the classic way to, to, to say, okay, he's, not, he's preferring to use the right eye, not the left eye. This eye is suspicious for amblyopia. And then you look at all of the amblyopia risk factors, you assess them for all those, and figure out why he might have amblyopia. Um, and, but sometimes it's more subtle than this, like in a perfect world, if they have no amblyopia, you would see, usually what you see is they look at your toy and then they look up because they, they're noticing like, oh, there's another image there. And then you put it on the, the prism on the other side and they look at your toy and then they look up because they, they're just noticing that other image. So that's, that's kind of a normal test. But then sometimes they will just use the, the eye without the prism each time. So they never look up, but they are, each time you, you move the prism, they still are fixing with that eye without the prism. So that's also normal because they're using each eye. Does that make sense? So there can be different iterations of this, and if you understand the principle of what you're testing, you can kind of interpret. But basically what you're looking for is you want them to use both eyes. And um, so how can we actually, this, those things are, actually, are most useful to me in a preverbal child, because some of this other testing is just not as sensitive, not very feasible, very time consuming. Like an OK drum. You know, sometimes I'll do this if, if there's like no tracking and you just think, wow, this kid really can't see anything. Like they're not fixing at all, they're four months old. Like, I don't know. Sometimes I'll use an okay and drum just to see, wow, will they, will they look at anything? But, and, and in theory, you can kind of approximate their visual acuity by whether or not they track the okay and drum, but we don't otherwise do that a lot. And, oh, and then I guess, um, and then the teller cards, forced preferential looking is all this is called, but they're teller cards, which I thought I had a thing on, I don't know where it went, but um, 
but essentially, I don't know if you've seen these in the clinic, we use them very infrequently, but it's like this giant thing that the examiner looks through a peephole, and they're showing each card is like this big, and you're including an eye, um, or not, I mean, depending on the kid. But you basically, it's, it's, um, it's a more and more fine grade of, of contrast stimulus, like just lines. Basically, and with a very uh, large contrast, large lines, large black and white space, that's kind of correlating with low sensitive visual acuity. And then um, the finer the lines are, the more fine your visual acuity is. So if a kid keeps looking at the finer and finer lines with one eye but not the other eye, then that eye doesn't see as well. But you can imagine how long. I mean, literally, the examiner, the tech is like behind here looking through the people, trying to figure out where the kid's looking. I just don't, it's not practical that really. We do it in very rare circumstances. And then the VEP, you guys know what a VEP is, but clearly we're not doing those on all kids. We just do them if we have a concern for visual processing. But I would say, um, we do kind of want to think about doing a VEP because many times it is requiring sedation and if these kids are already delayed, sedating them is not doing them any favors because anesthesia can not be good for brain development, neurodevelopment. And what are, we really have to be clear about the benefit of what the information we're getting. If we know the kid has a bad brain, for example, and they're not tracking, is a VEP gonna tell us a lot more? That VEP is gonna be abnormal because a VEP takes into account how your brain actually processes the information in your occipital cortex. If that brain is abnormal, that VEP is gonna be abnormal. And what is that telling you? And there is no data to follow these over time. So even in kids with gliomas, where to, in my mind, it seems like it would be more useful to have some understanding of how to follow these longitudinally because you have a tumor on the nerve. There's still no data to, to, to suggest that you even should follow these longitudinally with VEPs. So definitely in a kid with a bad brain, it's gonna be nor abnormal. It's not gonna inform your treatment because what are you gonna do? It's, you already know their vision is abnormal and their brain is abnormal and it could potentially harm their brain development given that they already have so many challenges. So that's just my soapbox about that. So, oh, here's the teller card. So you can kind of see <laughs> how silly this is. This woman looking behind here and then the kid trying to see. Uh, I think the, the principle is sound, but the, it is very um, logistically intense to do that. And I don't know, there's only rare circumstances where you really want that actual visual acuity information. You really more so need to know amblyopia, yes, no, risk factors, yes, no, let's treat that. And then by two years of age or three, usually, we get them with these palindromes. Allen pictures are okay, they're not palindromes and they often overestimate the visual acuity. So that's fine, but it, I mean, I think one thing is you, you wanna make sure you're testing them with the same, method each time and not like one time Allen pictures, one time Leah symbols, one time HOTV, because their visual acuity can vary just by the test itself. And um, so these are the palindromic ones and I like these the best. I don't really have a preference HOTV versus Leah, but, um, but I do like to stick with the same one for each kid, each visit. And um, I like to use matching a lot because some of these kids are really shy, um, even if they know the letters. Um, and crowding bars can't, can be used for both, really. And we'll mention that a little bit, but the crowding phenomenon is one I'm sure you've heard about. You can get that with a single image with crowding bars or you can get that with a line of text. And it's a phenomenon whereby an amblyopic eye will have poorer visual acuity because of the crowding phenomenon, um, but a normal eye will, will be unaffected by that. So it's, it is a way to, to critically assess 
the vision and, and whether you need to continue, continue your amblyopia treatment. And then um, by five years, we want them to read the Snellen chart. They should have 20, 20 to 20, 30 vision at this age. Those are usually the parameters. So when we get these failed vision screen, all those spot screeners, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, usually their cutoff is um, 20, 30 if they're using the eye chart. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of how the spot screeners flag these kids. And then obviously you want to do one eye at a time. And I like to patch them. You'll see a lot of our techs doing that if they're, if they're squirrely kids because they will cheat. And we see this very commonly. Um, they'll be peeking out from behind the occluder and then you'll think this vision makes no sense to me. And it's just because they were peeking. And if you put a sticky patch on, they can't do that. So um, if the vision's abnormal, you guys kind of know this, but you have to do a very detailed structural exam, checking everything, even things that on first pass look normal. You just want to make sure you're, you're really critically evaluating things and not just um, kind of checking the most common or, you know, because sometimes you'll just find the most bizarre things in these kids. But, um, so certainly they can have structural abnormalities. Amblyopia is a big one. Cortical visual impairment, you have to consider that if they have an abnormal brain. Um, and then sometimes kids really do just have delayed visual maturation. You see this a lot in preemies, but other kids can have it too. And um, this is where they have totally normal eyes. They're usually um, otherwise normal kids that have this and then um, they, they often get better with time and they just, have, they just have taken a little longer to develop their visual system, but usually it's, it ends up catching up in the end. So you always have to consider if this kid is cooperative with your exam, because you know we have so many kids that they'll, they'll not do a great job when we are testing their vision, but, but they can do other things they want to do just fine. So amblyopia is a big deal. If you don't catch it early, you don't get a redo. The, the period of um, visual maturity is where your brain is learning vision is birth to about seven or eight years. And that's the period where they're susceptible to amblyopia and also the period where we can treat amblyopia most effectively because um, once the brain is has completed that visual learning, it's hard to change it and rewire it to, to learn better vision. Because essentially amblyopia is brain damage. Um, and so it's preventable. There are, I don't know, there, there are the classes. So um, the, the classes really speak to the risk factors. You can have refractive, either bilateral high refractive error or anisometropic refractive error. Um, you can have strabismic or deprivation from cataract or other opacities. And then um, you can't really differentiate it based on vision. The crowding phenomenon is helpful. APD you can get in really severe amblyopia. Um, and it can coexist with structural problems, like someone with a <clears throat> optic nerve hypoplasia that's mild. That represents a difference in if it's unilateral in that eye between the other eye. So the vision might be mildly affected by the hypoplasia, but then um, that could be compounded and worsened if the brain perceives that that eye is not as good as the other eye. So some, you know, in severe hypoplasia where they just have no vision, they have you know, nystagmus, and they really just can't see out of the eye. I don't think there's a role for patching. But there is mild hypoplasia where the nerve is mildly affected, and they may have mild visual deficits. But you have to be aware that that can worsen because amblyopia can be added on top. So you want to consider that. And then, I mean, with these kids, you just have to kind of check them and check them again. <laughs> over time because there's variability to how they want to participate in the test and how their ability to participate in the test and you know so you just have to do it again and again and then um, I think the basic things are look at fixation behavior and use linear crowding bar testing um, to 
really sort out amblyopia. You can get mild, moderate, or severe, and it usually correlates to the um, etiology, but not always. And then we treat it with glasses and um, often removing the amblyopia risk factor. So sometimes glasses will do that. Sometimes you have to take out a cataract, et cetera. Um, so glasses are interesting because um, this guy at uh, Vanderbilt has done a lot of work on what, what is the amblyopic eight, uh, range of refractive error. And so I usually adhere to, I mean, he's done some really nice work on this. And so um, I always assess whether the child has amblyopia. And it does seem like if there's a family history of amblyopia, they, the kids are more susceptible. You at, at a relatively lower risk factor, like lower magnitude refractive error, you can see amblyopia in a kid that's more susceptible based on family history than you would in a kid who has no amblyopia in their family history. I have no idea why, but it's not all black and white, like just follow the chart, but this is a very informative chart on when you should prescribe glasses. Um, and then uh, certainly you guys know that we also use penalization therapy. Glasses themselves have been shown to improve amblyopia by up to three lines. I've seen glasses do much more than three lines, so I always, Unless it's severe amblyopia, I usually start with glasses, let the kid get used to those, let the family get used to those, see how much visual improvement we've gotten, and then decide if we need a penalization therapy, because these things are stressful for families to do, especially in their two-year-old. And so those penalization therapies include patching, you can do atropine, you can do optical occlusion with like a Bangator foil, or something that blurs one of their lenses. And, um, the younger they are, the more they respond to this treatment. And, um, and this just highlights that the older they get, the harder it is. However, we have done many studies. And this ATS-3 study, these are all PDIG studies. Have you guys heard of PDIG? PDIG is Pediatric Eye Disease Investigation Group. Mimi is our, uh, Mimi Young is our, um, like, Utah leader for that, but it's a multi-centered uh, uh, clinical investigative group that they designed all these trials. So they did all the infantile cataract um, trials, the infantile glaucoma trials. I mean, they do all the big trials that inform our clinical care. So I, I'm one of the participants, I think Bob is, and Mimi's are our leader and so we have had some of these trials come through we are limited uh, private groups actually private um, clinics can also have some of these trials and they 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 use the PDIG IRB to um, approve the protocol because they are not associated with an academic institution whereas we use our IRB which is usually which is fine our IRB is fine but it takes a lot longer so we don't get as many of the trials here. You won't see as many kids enrolled in these trials here because usually by the time our IRB approves it, they're like, well, we're only enrolling for like six more months. <laughs> so, but that, this trial showed, you may see some of these trials come through. They're very good, well-designed, interesting trials that, that highly inform our clinical care. This one showed that older kids, up to 14, I think, um, can see benefit from patching if their amblyopia is caught late and they do not have a significant history of patching previously. If they've patched and patched, you know, and then they stopped patching when they were nine and now their vision's still bad, restarting patching will not get them better than their best vision that they achieved when they were younger. So if they only got to 2070 when they were nine and that was the best they ever got, and now they're like 2100, and they don't get better with, with an updated refraction, you might argue that you could get them back to 2070, but you wouldn't be able to get it better. But if they'd never patched and they were 2100 in your clinic, they could probably get better than, than 2070 by patching. So, so amblyopia treatment, it's more of an art than a science. I mean, it's based on science, but kids are all different. You know, what are they gonna work best with, you know? Um, are they compliant with patching? Do the parents have a desire to force their child to patch? 
If not, should we try atropine penalization? Atropine penalization is very effective in certain populations, but not in every population because it works on the principle of cycloplegic um, um, blurring of the dominant eye, and that is more effective if that eye is hyperopic. If that eye is myopic, it's not as blurred to that child. So it's, it's less likely to induce them to want to use their non-preferred eye at near, which is what you actually want them to do. And so, so atropine is great, but it doesn't work equally in all populations. I have used a Bangator foil, so for kids that are good glasses wearers, but they just will not patch. They're not good ca candidates for atropine because of their refractive error. Um, putting a, it's a little foil that, that fits into the lens um, frame and our optical shops can kind of order them and fit them. They're, they're, um, they come in different powers. So if their bad eye is like 2200, you can get a 2200 Bangator foil and put that on their good eye. Um, and, and do that for you know four hours a day or something to try and get them to use their non-preferred eye. So there, there are lots of options and it's just a trial and error to see what is going, what, what dose of treatment will the child respond to, what treatment will they actually, um, will they actually do. I don't, this is green. Okay, that was fine. So the screening, let me make sure we have time to talk. Okay, well just, so the pediatricians, there is a contention in the field of how we should screen these kids. I think the best thing is what's supported by the AAO, APOS, which is the pediatric ophthalmology group, and then the AAP, the pediatricians. So the pediatricians do great jobs with red reflex testing and um, visual acuity testing at three to four years of age and things like that. But they also, so we know what, what these are, and I think by and large pediatricians do a really good job. Um, this was a patient I had at MUSC when I was a fellow there. He said every, he thought everyone had a bad eye. Um, but refractive amblyops are the ones that are missed because their eyes are straight. They don't have any visual complaints because their good eye takes over. They don't have blurred vision. Um, and so these are the kids that are now picked up really effectively when they're pre-verbal with these photo screeners that a lot of pediatrician offices have that are really great. Um, and so they estimate refractive error and... Um, they also, which is I think why most kids are referred to us, um, but they also uh, look at ocular alignment and things like that so they can, they can pick up strabismus. So two of the biggest, they can also pick up cataract because they will pick up if there's a clouding, but usually the pediatrician has picked that up just with their flashlight before that time. But, but pediatricians really have a hard time picking up anisometropes. So this is the population that has benefited most from these screeners. And um, there are groups that, that advocate for comprehensive eye exams for kids like every year of their lives. Um, and it was interesting because one study by that Sean Donahue at Vanderbilt said that for the um, number of newborns per year, that would be 20 million eye exams, $75 an exam would be like $2 billion a year, and we don't have the people to, and to uh, provide this service, nor is it needed. And when kids are screened in this way, which still happens to some extent, they tend to get glasses prescriptions that they don't need. So in this study, also by Sean Donahue, he looked at um, preschool-aged children who did not have amblyogenic factors, um, and he's, he said how often, so these kids were normal, how often did they get glasses even though everything was normal? And you can see in the chart, he looked at optometry, comprehensive ophthalmology, and pediatric ophthalmology in terms of who prescribed glasses for these really low refractive errors that are not within an amblyopic range. And so I think if we do all these comprehensive exams, we'll get more of that. And, um, and I think cost-wise it's not beneficial, but the other thing is that kids are normally hyperopic. And um, there's a normal hyperopic range, and we feel like that's important for them to reach immetropization. And um, we know there's a lot of other factors that influence that in terms of whether they'll eventually become myopic or whatever, 
But we do feel like, especially um, in, at the younger ages where some of these kids were given glasses, that hyperopic nature of their eyes does inform the level of accommodation that they have. And that level of accommodation is what we think plays into how your eye reaches amitropization. And if you give them glasses, you're fundamentally screwing with that. And so it could be harmful, not just cost ineffective. So the, the um, spot screeners, you guys, these are old picture, older pictures, but um, these are really good. There's different ones. They're not always accurate but they usually don't miss kids that need to see us. And so um, the, this is by far the, the biggest um, thing that we're seeing coming in from those vision screens, but they're really a good, um, a good change to the field to really pick up all the kids that really need to see us. So I think we made both lectures. Do you guys have questions about any of it? Well, we'll go over it all, too, as you guys come through, with the exception of Rachel. You've already done these, but um, Teresa, we can talk about how this goes, you know, into our actual practice, and as you guys all come through, we'll, we'll put it into practice for you. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great day.